Good afternoon, folks. How are you? Good to see you. Can I have your attention, please, just for a second? Where's my phone? What's it doing in the right pocket? All right, if you got one of these, can you please turn it off, put it in vibrate mode, or somehow make it not make noise over the next hour and a half? We would appreciate it. Um, I don't think I have any other uh, announcements. I think that was pretty much it. So, I, I, I hear you. Um, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. Thanks, guys. Turn one and two on, or do you want them on or off?
Hello. There we go. Welcome, everyone. Am I on? Welcome. Uh, it's great to have everybody here. Um, while it's still kind of dry outside, uh, this is, uh, and we have a busy week here at the center, uh, weather permitting for those planning on coming to the Tim Kaine event on Friday. As of right now, it's still on, but we'll give you an update on that. And a few of you may be coming to Washington on Thursday. We're doing an event uh, with the Brookings Institution on a 10 year anniversary of the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, with a star-studded cast. That's a half-day event. Uh, but we're still waiting to make a call on whether or not that's going to go forward. But at least we have today, and we're delighted to have it. Um, Supreme Court appointments are obviously among the most important things uh, a president uh, has the authority to do. And with the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, this could truly be a pivotal nomination. Um, or, or is it really? Uh, is, the, is Justice Kennedy, who was supposed to come on Friday, uh, really a swing vote? I'll let Micah talk about that in a minute. Um, or uh, was he actually a really solid and reliable conservative vote and, and Brett Kavanaugh is filling a seat? That is just one of the many questions that I hope our panel is going to explore today. I preceded one there. Um, this particular program comes out of longstanding work that Barbara Perry has been doing here as the Director of Presidential Studies. Barbara is the Gerald, Gerald Belisles Professor here at the Miller Center and directs the Presidential Studies Program. She co-directs the Oral History Program, which is nested inside of it. But Barbara's own scholarship has been on the Supreme Court and on the presidency as it relates to it. She takes up the lead on one of our streams of scholarship here, which is the presidency and the Constitution, a series of research efforts going on in that topic right now. Um, and that connects to Barbara's own background in addition to um, her own doctoral dissertation and other published work in that field. She was the Justice Tom Clark Award winner as the Outstanding Supreme Court Fellow. In addition to Supreme Court clerks, you may or may not know, the Supreme Court has fellows who are essentially scholars in residence that do research on different topics. And uh, she did that a number of years ago where she did research for Chief Justice William Rehnquist's speeches. She also briefed more than 3,000 visitors to the court from 70 different countries and taught in the Supreme Court Summer Institute. Um, and uh, she is a published author in the field with uh, having authored The Peacely Tribe, The Supreme Court's Image in the American Mind. Barbara has two terrific guests, uh, one of whom is really more than a guest. He's a member of our faculty here at the Miller Center as a senior fellow. And that's Sai Prakash. Sai is uh, both the James Madison professor at the law school as well as the Paul Mahoney research professor um, here at UVA's law school. Uh, Sai himself clerked on the court for Justice uh, Clarence Thomas. He is the author of a number of different articles and most recently a book on the presidency, uh, Imperial from the Beginning, the Constitution of the Original, uh, ex uh, the Constitution of the Original Executive. Um, he teaches con law, foreign relations law, and presidential powers. He comes uh, with a degree from the Yale Law School where he received the John Olin Fellowship in Law, Economics, and Public Policy. And before clerking on the court, he clerked for Judge Lawrence Silberman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And then finally, a guest and uh, a new friend to the center and someone we hope to be working with a great deal in coming years, and that's Micah Schwartzman. Micah is the uh, Joseph Dorn Refer Research Professor of Law and the director of the brand new Karsh Center for Law and Democracy. Uh, as you all may have seen today, the Miller Center announced with the College of Arts and Sciences that we're launching a democracy initiative of our own, and we hope that initiative will work with Micah and his colleagues at the law school on a range of issues. Micah teaches constitutional law and First Amendment law. Um, he uh, has uh, one spectacularly terrific degree, which is undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia, <laughs> as well as a doctorate in politics from Oxford and a law degree from Yale and all those other things. Um, He's written articles uh, and is the development editor for the Virginia Law Review. He clerked for Judge Paul Niemeyer of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. 
Um, he's done a postdoctoral research fellowship at Columbia University Society of Fellows in the Humanities. And he has a forthcoming book called Constitutional Law and Religion, as well as a book on the rise of corporate religious liberty. He's won the Margaret Hyde Award, the Daniel Rosenblum Award, and the Hardy Cross Dillard Scholarship. So uh, we really are very lucky to have three such distinguished experts in the field to burrow into the low politics of getting a <laughs> Supreme Court judge confirmed, uh, but the, the high and important issues of what will happen if and when that takes place. So with that, Barbara, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill, for those very nice introductions. Thank you all for being here. Yes, the, the low politics of, of Supreme Court uh, nominations as it, as it has come along uh, to this day. Uh, but as we like to say, when they go low, we go high. So we're, we're going to be studying the, the uh, high end of this. Um, let me start with a, a question for Sai. And we thought before we would get to uh, Judge Kavanaugh that we wanted to set the stage uh, for this nomination. And so to do that, we set it with the retirement of Justice Kennedy. And we were just talking in the green room uh, before we uh, came out on the stage that uh, the question was, uh, sometimes when Supreme Court justices announce their retirement, uh, some are announcing, in effect, that day they're retiring, or in the case of, of Justice O'Connor announced that she would retire when her successor was confirmed to the seat. So uh, when that took some time, she stayed on. So our question was, you know, what about Justice Kennedy? Um, and we were reminded uh, by Micah that he had announced that he would leave at the end of July. So that, that seat is definitely empty. So to Sai, let me begin by asking about the retirement of Justice Kennedy. Uh, were you surprised that it came at this time? Well, Barbara, I got to you know, let the audience in on a secret. I spoke to Justice Kennedy before his retirement, and uh, I told him, you're past your sell-by date. You need to uh, you need to retire. You know, I, I wasn't surprised because I, I had that stamped on his head, but I didn't know that date uh, was was applicable. I, I think uh, I think I had heard, I'm not sure from whom, that Justice Kennedy had stopped hiring clerks, and that didn't commit him to retiring, but it obviously made it more likely. Um, so I wasn't completely surprised, but you know. Uh, it wasn't as if I knew beforehand. He, I didn't talk to him, by the way, nor did I tell him he <laughs> was past the cell by It's that former clerk grapevine, though, that ah, the word out on the grapevine is that he's not hiring clerks for the next term. That's always a, a, a pretty reliable sign, I would you know, say. Actually, Micah is in, in charge or has been in charge of our clerkship's uh, placement. Ah. Uh, so he really knows everything that goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> I probably heard it from Micah, but I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no, no. I shouldn't, you didn't hear me say that. Well, I guess, though, if you are helping to place UVA law students in these plum clerkships at the Supreme Court, if, if you know that a particular justice isn't hiring, isn't that a sign? It would be a sign. I, I think this was a pretty carefully guarded secret, the timing anyway. Yes. When, when yes. I, I don't think there were that many Coming on the last there. day of, of this past yeah. term. Yeah. I, think, I think that was kept in a pretty close circle. And he's 81, do I remember correctly, um, in, in his early 80s. And while um, my dear colleague, many of you know Henry Abraham, who pioneered in the political science field the study of Supreme Court appointments, like to point out that Supreme Court justices rival only symphony orchestra conductors in their longevity. So you think of someone like uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who stayed on the court until he was in his 90s, or Justice Stevens stayed on until he was 90, and now Ruth Bader Ginsburg has announced that she will stay until she's 90. So 81 is still quite the spring chicken in Supreme <laughs> Court terms. But um, let me ask on a more serious note, Micah, um, we hear so often this term swing vote or swing voter or swing seat on the court, and of course that was applied to Justice Kennedy. Um, what does that mean to you? And can you talk a little bit about Justice, if you believe it exists, um, Justice Kennedy's role in that so-called swing seat? There's a report that Justice Kennedy didn't like this term very much to be described mm -hmm. as the swing vote suggests that you're moving backwards and forwards and that you're shifting positions. Or I think what, what the term implies is that there's a median justice. In between um, two polls, there's a justice whose decision uh, makes the difference in the court that that justice's uh, view is decisive. And um, I think there's no question that that was the case for Justice Kennedy, um, at least after Justice O'Connor's 
uh, retirement. He was the median voter in the middle of the court on some very important questions on affirmative action, on abortion, certainly on gay rights, on all, in all of those areas and many more. Uh, he cast the deciding vote in a 5-4 split, and a split that has existed for a long time on these issues um, at the court. Um, and so, um, he, you know, he earned this appellation as the swing vote. But I think maybe the decisive vote is, is a better way of describing it. In the middle of the court, uh, you needed Justice Kennedy's vote to win these cases. Uh, and where Justice Kennedy was, the court was. Um, with the exception, I think, of one very important case, and that has to do with the Affordable Care Act, where Justice Roberts made that decision. And we can talk about this more a little bit later, but uh, you know, who, who will be the median justice uh, on the court after Kennedy's retirement is an important question. And at least in that case, where Kennedy sided with the conservatives on the court, Roberts was the deciding vote. So it wasn't always the case that he was in the middle, mm -hmm. but very frequently in these hot button issues, that right. was his vote to cast. That we all pay attention to, and that the, certainly the general public pays attention to, and they are viewed as the most political uh, of the cases and, and the topics. And that, um, that concept that sometimes the person who's in that seat will swing to one side or swing to the other. And certainly in the long time I've been studying the court, that justice, Lewis Powell from Richmond had that so-called swing seat, and then when he left in, in 87, um, Robert Bork was nominated by President Reagan, and you probably remember the controversy over that at the time. Uh, and it, it triggers what I call, if you want to use that term, swing seat politics. And oftentimes the politics do go lower um, when, that, when, when it's viewed by both sides as the court being uh, at uh, at an inflection point, that it might be swayed if there's someone who's not viewed as uh, readily swinging from one side to another. Um, Micah, you, you mentioned some of the cases um, that Justice Kennedy, uh, some of the topic areas that he had voted in that uh, caused the court to swing to one side or the other, or he was viewed by those arguing before the court as the key vote in, in many cases. Um, can you talk a little bit about his legacy, both as it relates to that, but even more broadly? You know, I, I think there's no question that um, a big part of Justice Kennedy's legacy will be uh, about the gay rights decisions that he was the author for. In a series of cases, he recognized and expanded gay rights up to Obergefell versus Hodges, which recognized uh, a right to um, same-sex marriage. I mean, I think this will be a crucial part of how Justice Kennedy's remembered. But I, I mean, I think um, broader than that, he was a conservative centrist. And by that, I mean, on, on a range of cases, he really was the deciding vote. Um, you might have expected him to side with a conservative majority to reject abortion rights uh, in Roe v. Wade, but he didn't do that. Um, you might have expected that he would side with a conservative bloc to eliminate affirmative action, but he didn't quite do that. In all those cases, Justice Kennedy uh, voted with um, the liberals on the court to narrow the scope of those rights, but not to reverse them outright. So I, I think that will be also an important part of his legacy across a range of cases. Um, Justice Kennedy narrowed the space for certain types of rights, but left them intact. And the question will be what happens to those rights after he's gone. Um, as, as lawyers and practitioners and those who have strong connections to the court, um, what is your sense of how we, the public, should view those justices who find themselves or place themselves in that median uh, position. I can remember the, the year, some more than 20 years ago, that I did spend at the court, uh, and I was always grateful to Chief Justice Berger for founding the Supreme Court Fellows Program that uh, he patterned after the White House Fellows Program. And, and the reason I appreciated him so much for having done that is that he didn't set it aside just for lawyers. He wanted social scientists and historians to be part of it. So here I was as a political scientist without a law degree, um, spending a year at the court and seeing it behind the scenes. But I can remember my fellow fellows, all of whom were lawyers, uh, and talking to others during that year. And sometimes they would say about Justice O'Connor, Justice Kennedy, well, you know, those justices in the middle are just not as smart. They're just not the intellectuals that the others are on, on the more, perhaps more extreme ends. And I always, as a political scientist, I, I found that a little odd. But I wondered your thoughts. Did, how, did you, how do you view those justices who fall in the median position? I always thought for Justice O'Connor it made such sense because she was a politician. 
You know, she was the, the first woman to be a um, Senate majority leader in a state legislature. And when she would come to our events, especially when I did teacher institutes, I'd, I'd take teachers back uh, for a whole week to study the court, and she would come to a reception, and we would brief the teachers. And, and I remember people from the Supreme Court Historical Society would say, now, you remember Justice O'Connor had been a politician before she came to the court. So she will go around the room, she will speak to each of you individually, and she will use your name in a sentence. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what she was like. So I always saw her as that politician in the best sense of that word, if there still is a best sense of that word, that she was trying to find the compromise or the mid position. And I thought Justice Kennedy was a bit more like that. So your thoughts? I mean, as the person in the middle of this conversation, I, I, I take exception. Size in the comment. swing seat. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't think I hadn't thought about this part, but I don't think this makes sense, right? If you take nine Nobel laureates and ask them some question of science, we wouldn't say that the people in the middle of that distribution aren't as smart as the other seven or eight. I think I don't think it follows that the people in the middle don't, you know, aren't, aren't, don't have a theory or, or aren't just smart. It, that might be the case, right, in any given court, but it might also be the case that the people at the extremes aren't, uh, aren't as smart or, you know, aren't as, aren't as theoretically consistent. So I, I don't, you know, I think when people are saying that, they're, they, at least today, if they're saying it, they're, they're perhaps commenting on Justice Kennedy and Justice O'Connor. And I, I think, you know, they might have eschewed big theories, right, uh, that helped them guided them towards the proper resolution mm -hmm. of a case. And so they, they had sort of smaller theories and, and to some people, smaller theories might seem, you know, like no theory at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will say that Justice Kennedy, I think once said, it's easy for Thomas and Scalia to decide cases because they have a theory, I don't. And I think what he meant was I, I actually have to grapple with the case in a way that they don't. And I, I'm not sure that that's right either, but, um, <laughs> You know, I, it, I just don't think it's true that the people in the middle are inevitably somehow less thoughtful. Thank you. I always thought that was unfair. It was an unfair comment about the, the swing voters. Again, before we get to Judge Kavanaugh, could we talk a little bit about the newest member of the court? Um, Cy, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the first, uh, I guess it's term and a half now, of uh, Justice Gorsuch and where he is now uh, placing himself in these uh, first cases that he's uh, voting in, maybe opinions that he's writing? So Barbara, from my understanding, political scientists have taken a look at this and they say that Justice Gorsuch is the second most conservative justice on the court, second only to Justice Thomas. So for, you know, that, you know, that to me suggests some room for improvement on his part. <laughs> um, but I think, I think what it also suggests is that conservatives who favored the president for this issue um, have reason to, you know, to be thankful to the president and that liberals who opposed him had reason to oppose him. Um, he's, you know, issued many opinions, including many opinions that dissent from the denial of certiorari, other dissents that uh, dissent from summary uh, reversals of cases decided below, and in each one of these cases, he's adopted a rather conservative approach. Um, he's not a, a clone of Justice Scalia. Um, I think he has um, uh, views that, um, about the administrative state that Justice Scalia didn't share. He's more skeptical of it, uh, but he's certainly quite conservative. And as I recall, it was a Kennedy clerk himself, correct? So one would think maybe that had a bit of a moderating uh, influence on him. Uh, but certainly those people, uh, as you point out, conservatives are very happy in those people who voted for Donald Trump saying perhaps they didn't agree with him on all things or they didn't like his persona. Um, many, we hear, said, but I want the Supreme Court to be in the hands of conservatives if possible, or I would prefer the kinds of people a President Trump would nominate to the court rather than uh, a President Hillary Clinton. Um, so it looks like that is, that is working out. We know, of course, those on the liberal side um, were especially upset that that seat was um, held open um, by the Senate, by um, the leadership of Mitch McConnell to say, no, we're in the midst of a presidential 
election year, so we, we shouldn't go forward uh, with it. And uh, Merrick Garland, therefore's nomination by um, President Obama, um, did, not, did not move forward. So we understand why uh, people on, on different sides have different views. Um, can we look back at the 2017 term so we have a sense of how to place people, the newer justices like Justice Gorsuch or um, certainly coming up the possibility of, of Justice Kavanaugh. Can we look back at the 2017 term that has just ended in late um, June and talk about the cases that garnered the most publicity, or if you'd also like to add cases that those of us who are non-lawyers and perhaps don't pay as much attention to, but that you think have a real impact on society or business or um, any other aspect of the law, feel free. But um, Mike, I'll turn to you. Thoughts about the cases that made the headlines uh, through the term and particularly in the summer? Yeah, there were a series of blockbuster decisions from the last term. I'll just mention three. One is the travel ban, obviously, after his inauguration. Um, as the president, Donald Trump put into place uh, a much promised uh, ban on the entry of, um, of citizens from abroad, of uh, foreign aliens from um, several Muslim majority countries. This was um, described as um, a ban on Muslims traveling to the United States. Um, and it was challenged in the courts uh, at the district and circuit level. It was rejected, um, both in the Fourth Circuit, which um, is the court that covers our region in Virginia, um, and also in the Ninth Circuit out in California and Hawaii. The Supreme Court upheld an iteration of that ban, not the original one, and not even the second version, but actually the third version, which the president called the proclamation. Um, and, uh, and it held that that was within his authority um, to restrict travel from uh, people coming from abroad from various states that were deemed to be security risks. The court, with Chief Justice Roberts writing, said this was a threat to our national security. And even though there was evidence from the president's statements, lots of tweets, uh, which were at issue in the case, um, about animus, that is prejudice against Muslims, the court disregarded that evidence uh, in its assessment of the policy. Um, a second very important case coming out under the First Amendment's religion clauses, that is the, uh, the free exercise of religion, involved um, a baker out of Colorado who objected to baking uh, a cake for a same-sex wedding celebration. And there the court um, sided with the baker, but on narrow grounds saying that, uh, that the Colorado courts um, and some state officials had, um, had been biased against him in the lower court proceedings. Um, and so held that that process was tainted by what the court described as religious animus, as prejudice against the baker's views. Um, that case doesn't resolve the um, central constitutional question, so I think we'll see cases involving wed wedding vendors who object to participating in same-sex marriages coming back to the court. And then the third case I'll just briefly mention, mm -hmm. that involves um, unions and states that require non-union members um, to pay the equivalent of union dues. And here the court, in a case called Janus, held that the First Amendment prohibits states from requiring non-union members to pay the equivalent of those dues uh, in an important free speech challenge to public unions. This case has been a long time coming. Before Justice Scalia passed away, the, the court had taken a case raising this issue. And so I don't think there was any surprise in that outcome, but it's an important one for uh, for union funding. I think those are three big ones. There were other um, important cases, cases that might have emerged as the most important cases in other terms, but per perhaps overshadowed by those three. Um, Sai, give us a, a little preview. It'll, it'll soon be the first Monday in October when the court traditionally uh, begins its next term. Um, anything that we should be looking for, um, both again as, as laypersons, as I am not a lawyer, but uh, any, anything that we as care, careful observers of the political world, the legal world, um, the world of our society, um, but again, if there are other things that we should be paying attention to that perhaps we're not. Well, Barbara, you know, Micah and I discussed this, and we decided it was a boring term. <laughs> um, but the term isn't complete yet. They'll be taking cases throughout the year, up, up through the spring. Um, so that what we see now is just a handful of the cases they'll actually decide. Uh, the two cases that came to my, you know, uh, that sort of interested me, but might not interest people in the audience, one has to do with uh, something called the non-delegation doctrine. It's of interest to administrative lawyers and people who are interested in the separation of powers. Basically, Congress, by statute, sometimes delegates broad rulemaking authority to 
uh, administrative agencies, right? So for instance, it might tell the Federal Communications Commission, why don't you regulate the airwaves in the public interest without really saying anything else about what the public interest requires. And so it, it's basically, you might, on, on one view, it's basically giving its legislative power to the Federal Communications Commission. And the court, um, the New Deal actually struck down two such statutes that, uh, according to the court, um, delegated legislative power. As one justice said, it was delegation running riot. And the idea is the Constitution sets up Congress to exercise legislative authority to make rules over the rest of us. And it doesn't give Congress, the Constitution doesn't give Congress the authority to delegate that authority to someone else. Uh, those other people obviously wouldn't have to go through bicamerals and presentment, right? The passage in both chambers and presentment to the president. Um, since the New Deal, uh, the court has said that the non-delegation doctrine is part of our Constitution and has said repeatedly that Congress can't delegate legislative power. But since the New Deal, the court has repeatedly upheld every delegation of authority, including delegations like do, do what's best, right? Do what's best with this authority. Um, and so uh, there's a new case before the court about the Sexual Offenders Registration and Something Act. I don't know what the N stands for. It's, it's SORNA. And uh, SORNA basically requires reg registration of sex offenders uh, across the United States. And it applies in the states as well to people who've been convicted of state crimes. Um, what's the delegation question in SORNA is Congress told the Attorney General you decide whether uh, people who've already been convicted at the state level before this statute was passed, you decide whether they ought to register or not. And apparently they did this because some people wanted those uh, convicted felons to register. And other people said, this is just gonna be too burdensome to have everybody already convicted now register with the states. And so Congress said, well, we don't wanna take, one view is Congress said, we don't wanna take responsibility for this because we'll be blamed, so you decide, Attorney General. And in this case, it's someone who would have to register pursuant to the Attorney General's determination that they ought to register, who's saying it's unconstitutional. Congress has basically handed off this legislative decision without any standard confining the exercise of discretion to the Attorney General. That's a naked delegation of legislative power, and it's, it's forbidden. And it's, it's, I think, being litigated by the Stanford Supreme Court clinic. So it's got high powered uh, professors and we know, we know how much, how, how great professors are. <laughs> um, I should say one thing before I forget, Micah has a piece coming out in the Harvard Law Review on Masterpiece and the travel ban, right? It's mostly about Masterpiece. So you should, you should, you should, you know, those of you, you know, you should look out for his article. It'll, be a, oh, it'll be a real page turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to wait for the movie, but, uh, right. but thank right. you. We'll look for that. Um, there's one other case I'd mention, which is about uh, Double Jeopardy. Uh, Double Jeopardy, you know, there was a movie about it a couple of years ago, but Double Jeopardy <laughs> is this idea that the, the government shouldn't be able to try you twice for the same offense. So if you get acquitted, for murder, let's say, and then you know they find new evidence, too bad. They can't try you again. Uh, the double jeopardy clause, you know, says you can't be, you know, can't be subject to double jeopardy. And the court has had this exception to the double jeopardy clause, as you might call it an exception, which is uh, both uh, if if the state government is charging with offense, the federal government can charge you with the same offense. In other words, the state can have a murder statute, and the federal government can have a murder statute. And if they both have jurisdiction over you, they can they can both prosecute you and you can have two sentences, right? One a state sentence and one a federal sentence. And this has been part of the doctrine. Well, you know, the court took up a case where they're gonna decide whether to continue this precedent, which says, you, you know, it's called the dual sovereign doctrine, which is, you know, the fact that one sovereign is prosecuted, you say the state of Virginia, doesn't preclude the United States from prosecuting as well. So that's interesting because they might actually overturn a, a, a precedent. There, there are probably other cases as well, but those were the ones that interested me. And, and so now we'll move on to Judge Kavanaugh and what's so important, of course, about the possibility that he will uh, move through the Senate and be confirmed is that he will then sit on these two cases um, and he will be part of the oral argument process and part of the decision-making process. And then as Sai said, the court will be continuing to take cases on appeal uh, through the term. And so he will be sitting in those discussions um, to be taking cases or not um, on appeal from state courts and from the lower federal courts. So let's talk a little bit about his background um, on a court that you served as a clerk on to Judge Silberman, right, the D.C. 
circuit, which is a proving ground uh, for Supreme Court justices um, of both sides of the, the spectrum and both sides of the political aisle. Um, what should we be looking for in Judge Kavanaugh's background from the cases that he has decided, um, the votes that he's taken on the D.C. Circuit and opinions that he's written? What, what stands out to you, Cy? Well, my, uh, my colleague here, Micah, tells me that our, our other colleagues at the law school have concluded that Judge Kavanaugh is the most conservative justice on the D.C. Circuit, tied for, tied, tied for that uh, distinction or obloquy with uh, Karen Judge Judge Karen uh, Judge Karen Henderson, so he's quite conservative. Um, I, you know, I think you don't get a full sense of what he might do on a court because all lower court judges are bound by Supreme Court precedent, and there's obviously some wiggle room in that precedent. Uh, pe reasonable people can disagree as to what the precedent requires in in a given case. He's tended to see those cases in a more conservative light than uh, have his colleagues. Um, and so, you know, it's not surprising that he's issued more conservative opinions. I think this has manifested itself in the uh, abortion rights case the, about a minor who had crossed the border and wanted to have an abortion. And the government then said, well, we want to transfer you to a sponsor. And the question was, could they make the minor wait to have the abortion until after the transfer to the sponsor occurred? Or could the minor have the abortion right away? And he was part of the panel which said, you know, the... the uh, you can make the minor wait. It's not an undue burden within the framework established by Casey, which tinkered with Roe's uh, trimester framework. And he said that on the panel, and then the, the full court reversed him. Um, and I don't think it, it's, it hasn't gone to the Supreme Court. I don't know what its status is. So there have been a couple of cases like that. He ruled, um, or he concluded that a, a DC uh, ban on semi-automatic semi rifles was unconstitutional. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, I think he's been cautious in the sense that he hasn't gotten in front of the court, um, um, but he's been, he's been conservative. Mm -hmm. And we want to note that he was appointed to the DC circuit by uh, George W. Bush, Bush 43, as we, we call him here. Um, and so we, you know, we think that he's pretty car carried out the, um, the hopes uh, and, and the desires of his appointing president, as, as most members of, of courts tend to do. I think the, the political science studies showed over the years on the Supreme Court that 80% of justices appointed to the Supreme Court fulfilled the hopes uh, and the political views of their appointing justice. So that leaves only 20% to have strayed. And occasionally we've seen in, in our time someone like a Justice Souter, uh, for example, or Justice Blackman, um, who might not be considered swing voters, they actually swing to one side opposite of what perhaps their appointing president thought, and then they stay on that side. So they, they swing one time, and then that's it. They tend to stay on, on that side, again, for the cases that we pay attention to. Um, I also wanted to ask um, Cy about something in, in the background of um, uh, of Judge Kavanaugh that's garnered a lot of press, certainly leading up to the hearings. Um, and I know Asai is, um, one of the reasons he's here at the Miller Center is his expertise on the presidency, uh, on the, the foundations of the American presidency, the constitutional foundations, and he's writing a new book uh, on the presidency as well. So I particularly am interested in your thoughts about the work that Judge Kavanaugh did um, prior to becoming a judge um, it, with Ken Starr uh, in the Whitewater investigation of, of Bill Clinton and then ultimately the, um, the Paula Jones case um, of Bill Clinton and leading up to then the Monica Lewinsky business. Um, tell us about what you know about his work for Ken Starr and how that seems to have led him to um, certain conclusions that he's written in law review articles about investigations of sitting presidents. Yeah, sure, Barbara. He's, he's got an article in the Minnesota Law Review from, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, reflecting on um, the separation of powers and lessons he learned from serving with Ken Starr, who, by the way, has a new book out. I don't know how much Kavanaugh shows up in that book, but he has a new book out. Um, which is all about the investigation of Bill Clinton. Um, so I, I think in that article he says he thinks these investigations are distractions for President. Uh, uh, and he, I think he's basically, he's, I think he says something to the effect that President Clinton was, you know, it would have been better served if President Clinton were thinking about Al Qaeda and not about Monica Lewinsky or Ken Starr. 
Um, and he proposes that Congress pass a statute, um, two different statutes, I suppose. One that says the president can't be sued while in office for his personal acts. And uh, two, a statute that says the president can't be prosecuted while in office for his, any criminal acts that might have occurred while he's president or from beforehand. And I think he's, uh, he's concerned that, these, you know, that, that these, these investigations distract, and I think he thinks that if there is to be an investigation, Congress should be the one doing it through the impeachment process. Um, and of course, that, uh, that, th those claims uh, um, are kind of relevant to what's going on today in the country. <laughs> Just and uh, a Just a I think bit. some people suspect that that's his view about the Constitution as well. Um, but of course, you know, he's actually saying that Congress should pass a statute, not that the president has uh, immunity from criminal prosecution or civil, civil suits. Uh, having said that, the DOJ you know, has said that the president can't be indicted while in office, much less prosecuted. That's not going to change whether or not he's uh, on the court. And so this president's not likely to be prosecuted uh, until he leaves office, if at all. Uh, the, the civil suit stuff, you know, Clinton versus Jones is still good law. And of course, um, all kinds of suits are proceeding against this president for various things he may or may not have done either before or after becoming president. Right. So one can see why the incumbent would have been particularly interested in this particular judge's view, at least written in, in law review articles before he became a judge. Um, so we can perhaps talk more about that in our Q&A session. By the way, be thinking of, of your questions. We'll go to you in a little bit when, when we're finished our discussion, and we'll have someone come around uh, with a microphone for you. Um, when I got ahead of these um, questions to think about them through the summer when um, Christina, our wonderful colleague, and Stephanie and, and Alfred put together this program, um, the hearings hadn't happened. And so I was saying, let's look forward to the hearings and what do you think will happen? Now we can actually look back at them and say, um, what, what were your thoughts about um, what happened at the hearings? Um, one of my dear colleagues from my days at the court, not a, not a justice, but uh, wrote an email to me recently and said, I think we should just do away with Supreme Court confirmation hearings. He said they just have become a circus and they're meaningless. And so let's take those two things. W what struck you, Cy, about what you saw? And then maybe let's add this slightly more provocative uh, view of, of these hearings that they've just become a, a political and journalistic and media circus. I, I, and they didn't used to exist, by the way. They're a modern phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, you're of course right, Barbara. We didn't have Supreme Court hearings or nomination hearings, uh, you know, for quite a long time. Um, I, I was, I mean, I didn't listen to every uh, person testify or, or even all the speechifying or the testimony or questions and answers given by Judge Kavanaugh, but I, I did catch a glimpse of the first day, and I guess I'm a, a little old-fashioned, but I thought, I didn't think, I don't know, wh whatever you think about him, I, I didn't care much for the shouting in the gallery. Um, I, I thought that was disruptive, and I didn't think it really helped their cause. I don't think anybody's moved by that, but of course I could be wrong, I, I don't know. But that's my personal view about that sort of uh, tactic as a, you know. Uh, um, as, as far as the, the hearings themselves, I think it's quite true that, you know, senators on both sides, had, had most of them had already decided before the hearing began, and uh, Judge Kavanaugh is smart enough not to answer any question uh, that would prove, the answer to which would prove controversial. So he's just not going to say anything that um, will harm his chances for being put on the court. That's the lesson of the Bork hearings. You, you just don't answer questions and you say it could come up before the court. And every justice has, has every nominee has said that since then, has done that since then. And so he just used the same playbook they did. So if you're not gonna get any meaningful answers, um, um, from the, the, the nominee, um, and you're just gonna have to, just a bunch of speechifying by the senators, you have to question uh, the wisdom of it. Having said that, um, if the senators feel that they're getting political mileage back home from doing it, it will continue. Right? It doesn't really matter what I think about the utility <laughs> of it, right? They, they clearly like being on TV and, and you know. Shocked, I'm railing. shocked to hear that, that senators <laughs> like to be on television and like to spout off. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't actually think it will go away. I, 
I'd be actually surprised. I mean, similar things have been said about Supreme Court arguments, that they're just a justice, I think that was the view of Chief Justice Rehnquist, they were a complete waste of time, but <laughs> they didn't really illuminate anything uh, about the case um, that wasn't already in the briefs, but they're still there. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's fun to watch the, the pomp and circumstance of, uh, of a Supreme Court oral argument. Right, it gives the public who's there that opportunity to see all nine justices uh, arrayed in their robes. Uh, and I think at their finest um, to be asking these questions of, uh, in very complex matters. Um, and I'm, in one way, I'm sorry that they're not televised, but on the other hand, I think by virtue of televising these hearings, we see what happens both in the gallery as well as uh, among the senators on the panel. Um, it did occur to me in, in watching the, the extreme partisanship that, that we now see, and, and Bill joked about the low politics, um, it, it has, I think lowered. It's it's not as though there haven't been controversial appointments going all the way back to our founding with um, the battles between the Jeffersonians and and the Federalists uh, over the courts. But um, I, I, in looking back over our oral history of Teddy Kennedy, you know we do presidential oral history here, but because we do that, uh, Ted Kennedy when he was coming up to the uh, 40th anniversary of his time in the Senate. Uh, was suggested by his wife, uh, Vicki Reggie Kennedy, and by the great Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who was a founding father of modern oral history, that he do an oral history of his time in the Senate, of his biography, of his family. Um, and so I think in part because long before I came to the Miller Center, the Miller Center had established the gold standard in presidential oral history and the fact that uh, Teddy Kennedy had gone to law school here, um, they came to the Miller Center to do his oral history. So a, a major piece of it is about the role that he played, including in the Bork uh, nomination, uh, to bring that down as he, he led the charge against that. Um, but prior to that, um, I, I, so I added up, he, he was a part of t about 20 Supreme Court appointments in his 47 years in the Senate. And for most of the first half of those, so 10, 11 of them, he voted for, and, and apparently rather happily voted for, um, justices appointed by a president of, a, of the opposite party. And then we do see that shift, um, particularly in the, the Bork uh, years of 87, the hearings, the swing seat politics that came to the fore. Um, so I think it's something for us to keep in mind how things have shifted the role of interest groups. Maybe we'll get into that as well. But I wanted to turn to Micah. I, I was so excited uh, as well when you joined the panel uh, consisting of, of Cy and myself because of your background in religion and, and the law and religion in the Constitution. Um, and of course, that's a key point of the bakery case, which I'm sure is why you're writing on it. Um, but I also am fascinated by, and in fact, wrote part of my dissertation on the fact that Members of the Supreme Court have been appointed uh, over the history of the court because of certain representative characteristics that they have had. And early on in our history, it was their geographic representation. So uh, early, early on, the state they represented. And I'm putting air quotes around representation because we don't tend to think of the Supreme Court as supposed to represent anything, any particular viewpoint or any particular president or party or state, or eventually that became regional. And as we got closer to the Civil War, that obviously became an issue. Uh, but then in the latter part of the, um, the 19th century, um, a person's religion came into to play. So a Catholic seat developed on the court, certainly into the 20th century. A Jewish seat developed on the court once Louis Brandeis was appointed in 1916. And then with Justice O'Connor uh, created the woman's seat and Thurgood Marshall created an African-American seat. So now we have come to a situation where I've, I've referred now to the court is not having a Catholic seat, but there being a Catholic court because you have six, if Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed, you will have six members of the court uh, who have at one time or another been Catholics <laughs> and um, may have switched over as in um, Judge Gorsuch's case has gone over to uh, the Episcopal Church but was raised as a Catholic or in Justice Thomas's case was 
uh, raised, I think, in a, a Southern Baptist tradition, um, went to Holy Cross uh, for his undergraduate work, um, and at one time was an Episcopalian, but then sort of came to talk about swinging, swung back to a, a Catholic tradition, so now uh, is a Roman Catholic. Uh, and in fact, we do not have any Protestants represented on the bench or any Eastern religions represented on the bench. We have, uh, if again, Judge Kavanaugh is, um, is confirmed, we'll have either all Christians and Jews and mostly those of a Catholic background. So to, to Micah, do you have a sense that um, the court, in order to be more representative of the country, um, should be a little bit more diverse uh, in the religious backgrounds of, of those who serve in, in the highest court in the land. I think the court should be diverse in lots of ways. So uh, maybe as important as religious diversity, which it has a little bit of, they could have diversity with respect to the law schools from which the justices came, right? They all come from Harvard or Yale. We could send another one from Virginia now. <laughs> no, 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 good. Let's work uh, on that. Right, so um, I, I want to be cautious about the question of religious diversity because I, I think it's a mistake to say that these justices represent certain views because of their religious background. Right? I mean, Sonia Sotomayor is also Catholic, and her views are very different than, say, Justice Thomas uh, or Justice Gorsuch, or um, if he's confirmed, uh, Justice Kavanaugh. And the fact that they share um, some commonalities in their religious heritage doesn't mean that their jurisprudential views um, overlap on lots of questions. So I, I think it's important to be cautious uh, about this. Um, you know, there was a potential uh, that we might see someone nominated um, who has a different religious background. Um, there, are, uh, there are circuit judges who are not Christians or Jews. Um, and so, um, you know, it's possible for a president uh, to, to pick someone with an otherwise conventional uh, legal background for the court. And I think it would be healthy for the court, including for its uh, religion clause jurisprudence, to have um, diverse perspectives on this issue. But I don't want to read too much into, into religious background. It is interesting, though, that, um, that you, you see um, within uh, conservative legal movements, Catholics coming to the fore. Yes. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that's accidental. Um, but um, you know, there, there's a long tradition of Catholic social thought and of natural uh, of thinking about natural rights and natural law. Um, Justice Gorsuch trained with John Finnis, who's a leading uh, intellectual in this area, and his writings have been influential. Um, so there, you know, there is uh, in the education a formative process there. So I, I, you know, I think there are Catholic influences in in the background for some social conservatives. But again, that's not true of all Catholics, and, and I wouldn't want to impute that to the, to the justices. Right. I know when I first started studying this as, as my uh, dissertation research, um, I had the opportunity through Henry Abraham to um, meet with and interview Justice Brennan, who was a good friend of, of his, uh, and then Justice Scalia, who also became a good friend of Henry. And, and I'll never forget Justice Scalia writing back and saying, yes, you may come to uh, talk to me about the Catholic seat if that's what you think I sit in. And I could just see the eye roll in the letter that he wrote to me. Um, but very quickly then, he was followed by Justice Kennedy to the bench. So in terms of the moderation of Justice Kennedy, I always thought it was quite fascinating that you had, at that time then, the movement beyond a Catholic seat to three Catholic serving, which people took note of at the time, and they almost exactly followed three different parts of the political, ideological, almost partisan spectrum, but even the Catholic spectrum of you had Justice Brennan, who in his interview with me said, yes, I, I'm, I'm a very practicing Catholic. I get, my wife and I go each weekend to St. Matthew's Basilica here in Washington. He said, we tend to go to the Saturday evening mass. He said, of course, I, because of his abortion jurisprudence, he said, I'm often heckled on the way into mass. And believe it or not, when I went to his funeral um, back in the 1990s, which was held at St. Matthew's. They were bringing his casket up the main aisle of that beautiful church, which was also where President Kennedy was buried from. Um, and they closed the doors of the church, but you could still, still hear the protesters outside shouting down Justice Brennan's abortion jurisprudence. Then you had Justice Scalia, of course, on the opposite side of, of the spectrum in terms of his views, not only of Catholicism and abortion, um, but also, um, 
his views of the jurisprudence of, of separation of church and state, and then Justice Kennedy tending to fall in that moderate position on, on church and state. So I, I especially enjoyed studying that, again, not to take it too far, but uh, given their different backgrounds. Um, it, it was just fascinating. Um, let's talk, I mentioned um, interest groups. Um, I know that um, Bill and I went up to the Heritage Foundation with some of our colleagues. Um, Bill, that was just after the election, as I recall. Pardon me? The 100-day mark. The 100-day mark of the Trump administration. And um, we had several panels that we ran um, with Miller Center scholars and our colleagues at the Heritage Foundation. Um, and we had a very nice lunch in between a couple panels. And um, I have to say that the, uh, that the atmosphere was gleeful, <laughs> not only because President Trump had, had been elected, but when we put the question to them about Supreme Court appointments, they were uh, quite excited and their eyes lit up and they said, oh, you know, the, the, the swing seat could come open and it could be Justice Kennedy. And, um, and, and we, we can't wait for Justice Ginsburg to, to step down, to retire. Um, this, again, is not a new phenomenon of, of interest groups partaking in, in the process of, of um, the, the appointments process, but it seemed more obvious this time, I think, because of uh, particularly the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society uh, giving to candidate Trump their lists of people they would like to see uh, on the bench. And, and Justice Gorsuch, as I recall, was one of those. And then I think um, Judge Kavanaugh was added a, a bit later after the election. Um, but do you have thoughts about that, Micah? Um, are, are they play, are not, on both sides, are interest groups playing, playing too large a role in this? Or is it just where we are and we have to accept it? And, hope that they're balanced out. Well, it is where we are. I mean, wh how, you know, wh what should happen, how the nomination process or confirmation process should work um, are large questions. But I, I, I think one reason why, I mean, I think you gather that there's some glee, but also that they're playing a larger role now. Uh, I, I think that's partly a function of the demise of the filibuster. I mean, the, mm. the- Talk about that. Yeah, so the Senate norms that used to moderate the influence of, of various interest groups, both within the states um, uh, at the, in, in terms of district and circuit nominations, so nominations below the level of the court where senators had influence on the judges, but also at the Supreme Court, right, with the filibuster requiring a supermajority of, of the senators um, in order to, to get a, um, a, a nominee confirmed, I, those had some moderating influences. Where you couldn't you couldn't uh, nominate uh, judges who were um, far to the right of um, the mainstream, or you know within the mainstream of your party, but not acceptable uh, to the to moderates on the other side. Without the filibuster, and now the filibuster is gone for both Supreme Court nominations and also circuit nominations uh, below. Um, it's possible for uh, groups like the Federal Society to have um, stronger influence and to move forward judges who, uh, you know, who share their views m much more directly. And they've been very successful. I, I mean, the, the, I think the members of the Federal Society should be quite proud of, of what they've been able to accomplish. President Trump has moved uh, an enormous number of judges in a fairly short time. And this uh, Kavanaugh will be the second Supreme Court nominee, but at the at the level just below that, at the circuit level, we've seen I think it's now 26 uh, circuit judges, which is in two years double the rate uh, that President Obama saw. There are something like 70 pending district court nominations, so there are a lot of judges um, in which uh, the Federal Society has had a hand in um, helping uh, the president to to pick people who share their views. Um, I, I would assume that will be um, similar on the other side if, the Demo if and when the Democrats uh, regain control of the Senate and maybe one day the presidency, we'll see something similar matching uh, the federal society's influence. I, I think we're just seeing tit for tat um, and when norms erode and we get polarization, I think that, that's the expectation at this point. We, we don't have anything besides the hard rules that are fixed in the Constitution in terms of how many votes you need uh, in the Senate and, uh, and obviously a presidential nomination. And when you, have, when you have the numbers, I think that's at the end of the day all that matters. It comes back to this point about, you know, are the, are the nomination hearings, the televised hearings, is there any point to them? And if all you think that matters is the number of votes you have and the constitutional rules that tell you how many votes you need, then they don't really matter very much. And I think you're seeing the influence of interest groups because all that really matters is do you have the ears of the senators and the president? And if you do, then you can move your nominees. 
Uh, well, speaking of numbers, and we're getting close to our Q&A time, um, if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, or if you don't think of it in your head, what do you predict the vote will be in the full Senate? Presuming, I think we can, that the nomination will get out of the committee. Um, what, are, what is your guess? We should have a pool, I think. What is your guess as to um, the, the vote on the full, full floor of the, of the Senate? And with that, I'll turn to our two colleagues and ask, would you like to predict what you think the vote will be? <laughs> <laughs> You know, how many senators are there? <laughs> I, 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 last, I yeah. would well, say... Well, actually, yeah, we're back up to 100 now. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, that I, was a trick I, question. That was a trick <laughs> question, yes. yes. it was. You know, I don't really know, but I would say 53 to 47. Okay. Micah? That sounds about right to me. <laughs> Somewhere between that and party line, yeah. How many of you had 53? Well done. Um, well, let's start with some, some Q&A. Um, Christina is here in the back of the room. Um, I see we have a couple over here. So if you'll, uh, as I say, we're playing Jeopardy, so be sure to put your comments in the form of a question. Yeah, of course. Yes, and uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Very wow. interesting. Um, this is a, not a rhetorical question. I don't know the answer, but I noticed that the examples you gave about Kennedy's um, middle of the road positions related to social issues, all of them, uh, abortion rights, gay rights, uh, affirmative action, church state issues. And of course, many of the important decisions the court has to deal with relate to uh, financial matters, regulation, government, uh, you know, government authority in terms of the economy. Uh, does Kennedy come out somewhat different, more conservative when you deal with those issues? Because they're certainly equally important in comparison to the social issues we hear so much more about because I guess they're dramatically exciting. You want to go first on presidential powers? Oh, uh, was, there, was it about presidential powers? I, well, I did administrative uh, state. Yeah. So I'll say this. Our I, business. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're right to point out that the cases I mentioned are cases involving um, social issues. Uh, and there are a range of questions involving uh, the administrative state, uh, economic regulation. And I'll just give, again, one example. That's uh, about the Affordable Care Act, where Kennedy sides with the conservatives on the court. And the swing vote turns out, surprisingly, I think very few academics predicted this, the swing vote was Chief Justice Roberts, uh, who turned out in that case um, to, to side with uh, the liberals on the court, at least for part of the case, not for all, all of the issues. But and Michael, you, you mentioned that early on. Why do you think you did that? So, I'm, you know, uh, that's a hard question. The parlor game, uh, yeah. I, I realize. So, I, you know, I, I think Many people take the view that the chief has a sense of statesmanship with respect to the court's position, that it's very difficult historically for the court um, to, uh, to side against um, a president on a question that, the, um, that formed the basis of the preceding election, where the president was elected with a mandate to pursue some social uh, legislation like the Affordable Care Act. You see the chief in the majority in the Affordable Care Act, but let me just also mention, pursuant to that last thought, you also see him in the majority on the travel ban. And you might think that's also a signature issue for the president. And on a signature question, I think the, the chief has to take into account the court's legitimacy in a way that it might not on some other questions. Now, this is something of a speculation, but a pretty, I think, widely held view that the chief was concerned that um, putting the court into direct conflict with the president and the social movement that, uh, that, that enabled that president's election is a dicey um, move for uh, a chief justice and a Supreme Court to take. That's one theory anyway. Um, just to the to the question ab about Justice Kennedy, I, it reminds me of of seeing him in the mid '90s um, speak to a group of uh, graduate students from UVA that uh, Henry Abraham had brought up to the court. And I always remember that I guess in his thinking, Kennedy's thinking about being viewed as the swing vote. Um, maybe this is why he dropped this into his conversation with the students. But he said, you know. 
Um, people pay attention to these hot button issues that we decide on, these hot button political and social issues. But he said, I always like it when we have, and he used the, the ERISA term, and my, I'm going to turn to my colleagues. ERISA, do you remember what? Thank you. I've turned to my audience. I never remember what it stands for. Um, in other words, it has importance, but it's not the sort of thing that people generally in the public would pay attention to. He said, I like those ERISA cases. <laughs> and oh, we thought, why is that? And he said, because it, we don't split along, we tend to not split along ideological or any kind of partisan line. And he said, I get to work with different people, my different colleagues in the court, we form into different blocks on the court, which I thought was a fascinating kind of humane and, and human thing to say. So I always appreciate that. Um, Christina, we had another question here on the side, and then we have one in the front. Again, thank you. This, this is a wonderful afternoon. Uh, before the hearings, uh, we heard a lot about settled law. Then on the third day, we heard about settled, settled law. If Kavanaugh is appointed, will there be unsettled, settled, settled law? These known, unknown, known. <laughs> no, I think it's quite known that the Supreme Court over time overturns its precedent. So whatever is settled law now won't necessarily be so in the future. The question is what cases will become unsettled? And, and uh, that's hard to predict uh, for, you know, because you have nine members on the court. But the idea that everything that we have now will be with us forever, I think, is, is not borne out by any experience. But Micah mentioned one case last term, right, the controversial case about union fees where they overturned a, a case involving the First Amendment. That's going to happen on both the left and the right. Uh, you know, I think what people are most concerned about is Roe versus Wade. And, uh, they have reason to be concerned. See, there was a question here, and then we'll have one in the back and one over here. Thank you again for coming. I'll stay seated for practical purposes. Um, I was wondering, we've talked about how the, um, the balance of the court will shift with the new member, but do you see the types of cases coming to the court changing based off its changing composition? And, and could you talk a little bit about um, how the court determines its docket? And how many cases does it get typically in a year appeal to it? How many does it tend to take on appeal? Um, and how does it determine which of those many cases it, it, it takes that it will, that it gets that it will take on appeal and here? This is you. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the court, uh, has some cases it has to hear by virtue of congressional statute and those are mandatory appeals but that's only a small fraction of the number of the cases the court hears most cases are taken up on a discretionary basis through a, a through a process called certiorari where the court um, solicits petitions for certiorari and that's basically a, a a loser in the court below saying we'd like you to hear this case and we, they file a petition saying why the court should hear it. Typically, it's because there's some significant question of federal law and or there's a split amongst the various federal circuits. And, um, you know, I think 95% of the cases are taken through that process. Um, how do they decide which courses, which uh, cases to take? It actually is kind of uh, odd. They, they have a, a rule of four. If four justices of nine say they want to hear the case, they hear it. So it's, you don't need a majority to take a case. You, you actually need some, something less than that. And there are certain justices who, at least in the past, have said, if there are three justices who want to hear the case, I will join them, even though I really don't want to hear the case out of deference to their views. So you can have um, less than a majority controlling the agenda of the court. Uh, Mike and I were discussing this beforehand, but the court has actually, over the last 20 or 25 years radically reduced its course load. Um, it used to hear, Micah says, 200 cases a year, and now it hears about 60. Uh, and I think its salary has gone up in the, in the meantime. <laughs> Not much. So it's a, good job. it's a good job if you can get it. I, I highly recommend <laughs> it. Um, I, I think a lot of people thought the court was hearing too many cases in the 70s and that it showed in the work product it was, mm -hmm. that people thought it was sloppy and you know, ill -considered, there were ill-considered opinions. And of course, you, uh, that could still happen today, but I think it's less likely to happen if you hear fewer cases. 
And there's probably also a sense, because the court has become, I think, more conservative, that they don't want to interject themselves into society as much as, as prior courts have. I think that's a, a general conservative bent, but you know, liberals can believe that as well, especially if they don't like what the court is doing. Um, so that's how they decide what courses, uh, what cases to take. And obviously, uh, a new justice brings different perspectives about what cases are worth hearing. And so, it may, I mean, he may very well affect uh, what cases they hear. I, I think it was uh, an, an Arthur Goldberg and maybe a Justice Brennan. Uh, conversation because I've always been fascinated that they only needed to have four votes to take a case on appeal um, and so apparently there was a conversation in their secret conferences where not even the clerks are allowed certainly not judicial fellows where uh, Justice Goldberg I believe it was was pushing to get this fourth vote and couldn't get it he just had three votes in among the nine in the conference and when they left the conference he went up to Justice Brennan and said, well, I know you want to take this case, and you and I are on the same side. Why didn't you offer me the fourth vote? And this may be apocryphal, but it sounds very like Justice Brennan said, where's your fifth vote? So if you think about it, you know, they have to think, they have to play chess several moves ahead because do you want to take a case not knowing that you have at least some opportunity to have at least a fifth vote when it's heard in full and decided, because you do run the risk that if you don't have that or starting to line that up, that you could lose, your side could lose. And that, you know, you could still want to take it if you're willing to put up with that. But um, there is a lot of strategy. Uh, Can I add a thought? Counts. Which is Absolutely. Just in response to your question, that of course the litigants are making the same kinds of strategic decisions. So to the extent that um, a new justice changes their calculus about whether they could be victorious on an appeal to the court. Um, it may change the kind of litigation that goes forward. Some groups may say, look, we, we can't win these cases, so we're just going to stop bringing them. And some groups will say, we can win a case that we couldn't win earlier, and now we should advance appeals that maybe before they wouldn't have. So yeah, I think we'll see a, a slight, I mean, it's slight, we'll see some change in the docket. And Justice Ginsburg used to say, too, how different that was. It, I think it was Sai who mentioned on the D.C. Circuit, you know, typically, uh, at least the first go-round on a case, they sit in three judge panels. Um, so, and then they can hear it on, an, on banc or the entire circuit, but um, it's more likely that they'll be hearing in these three judge panels. And she said when she moved from the D.C. Circuit up to the Supreme Court as a justice, that was one of the biggest shifts she had to make in her thinking and how she did her work was that she didn't have to convince just one other person. Uh, if she had a position she wanted to go for and try to win, she had to uh, convince four other people. And again, this, I, I, th I think I heard Justice Brennan say this directly, so it, it's, it's not apocryphal in this sense. But he apparently, when his new clerks would come in, would say, what do you think the most important word here is at the court? And you know, these exceptionally bright people like, like Cy would say, liberty and equality and justice and uh, you know, high jurisprudential theories. And, and then and he loved to wait for the punchline because he'd say, nope, nope, nope. And then he would hold his hand up and say five. That's the most important uh, word at the court. And he was a master at, at trying to get that together. We, Christina, we had a question in the back. And then um, actually, could we come right here? Um, and then we'll go to, the, to this gentleman in the back. So could we go here and then to the gentleman in the back? Uh, just back, just, yes, right there. Uh, yeah, this is actually a quick question. So I hope it's not on Arissa. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, so Iowa passed uh, this very restrictive abortion uh, pr prohibition. Basically, after six weeks, uh, abortion is banned. So that, and I'm sure there's others out there. So what is the timing of this? I think it was, it was passed last year. So what's the timing of when that could appear before the court? Or something like that. Yeah, I mean, there's a question of procedurally how fast it could come. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, the procedural posture of the, of the Iowa um, law or litigation around it exactly, but there'll need to be a district court judgment that can take some time, maybe a year or so even. Um, that would go up to the, um, in that state, I think Iowa's in the eighth, right? 
can go up to the Eighth Circuit. Uh, that can take a while uh, for a Court of Appeals to make a decision. It can be then appealed to the entire Court of Appeals. So we would go to a panel, a three-judge panel, and then to the entire court. All of this can take time. And at, at the same time, a, a law, let's say in Iowa, was being challenged. There'll be other laws around the country also that are facing similar challenges, whether they're as drastic as the Iowa law or even more outright prohibitions, for example. Um, all of those could proceed simultaneously. Um, and then the court could simply just refuse to hear these cases. The court will have, I think, some opportunity in the abortion context to decide which challenges it wants to hear and when. It will have um, some opportunity, or at least four judges anyway, will have some opportunity to make a call on which of those cases they want. And that's about, in part, their, their judgment um, of how quickly or, or not they want to move in, uh, on abortion rights. How quickly and how far? Do they want to move incrementally or back to settled law? Would they want to overturn Roe and Casey? Or would they want to, the term often uses, chip away at those precedents? So that's I mean, part of it If they want to well. make incremental moves, they can take laws that are, let's say, less drastic than this one uh, and, and measure them and review them and then proceed on to, to laws that, you know, that cut further against abortion rights. If they want to move faster, then they'll take a law like this one. They, I mean, in some circuits, they might not. They might have a lot of pressure, right? I mean, to the extent that a, that a circuit court in in Iowa in, in the in the eighth the um, court of appeals might well uphold a law like that. If they do, they'll be under great pressure, I think, to hear a case of that kind. We have time for just one more question, and I, I certainly am able to stay. I can't speak for my colleagues who may, may be going off to dinner, but um, I am able to stay. Maybe they are as well. So if you didn't get to ask your question, please approach us after, and we'd be happy to chat with you. Yes, sir, in the back there. Yes, uh, <clears throat> with uh, the eight associates, assuming Kavanaugh confirmation, the eight associate justices seem to be as clearly divided for four, four as any time I remember. Uh, therefore, de facto, the Chief Justice seems to become the swing vote. Uh, given that he seems to have some sense of history and it's his court, do you see his role is this uh, changing at all from what it has been with, uh, uh, with Justice Kennedy on the court? Thank you for that question. You just brought us full circle because we opened uh, with Micah's comment about the chief. So any thoughts here as we conclude about the role that the chief will see him himself playing? I think Micah's description of the chief justice's thought process in the, in the ACA case, uh, I think is, is accurate. I think there's reason to believe that he had joined the dissenting justices in saying that the ACA um, was unconstitutional with respect to the individual mandate. Um, and I think he was perhaps moved by the, the criticism um, you know, leveled by President Obama and others. And so I suspect that you know, whether or not he's going to uh, act on this view that the court's position or legitimacy might be questioned by its decisions, people will assume that he will be amenable or susceptible to pressure, and pressure will be brought to bear against him until he can show or he can, and it's hard to show. How do you show that you're not susceptible to pressure, right? Because you don't know, when he votes that way, you don't know whether he's giving in to pressure, whether he actually thinks that the statute, the individual man, you know, the, 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 the penalty was a tax, which is what the issue was in the ACA case. So, uh, you know, I, I think people who prevailed in that case will take the lesson that pressure works. Um, that's the lesson I would take, not, not because you're sure of it, but because it's certainly consistent with what you take to be what happened. And, and then there's a question, right? You know, if, if you continually try to, quote, pressure someone and they don't buckle, at some point you might give up. But other than, you know, Chief Justice Roberts, what other option do they have? It makes the most sense to, to try to craft your arguments. I mean, it was, a, it was astonishing to read petitions for certiorari and, and merits briefs to see how many citations there were to Justice O'Connor when she was on the court and how many citations there were to Justice Kennedy when he was on the court. Because oftentimes you have to get to five, but to get to five, you had to get to one. And they would know that they had to get that one justice. And so they were like basically writing and talking and arguing to that one person. And now that person might be Chief Justice Roberts.
I, I would just add, I think the Kavanaugh uh, confirmation, if that's what happen, happens, um, really brings Chief Justice Roberts into full. It becomes the Roberts court, um, more directly uh, controlled by the chief as the deciding vote in many cases. Um, to the extent that Judge, now, you know, if he's confirmed Justice Kavanaugh is to the chief's right on many issues, which I suspect he probably is. Um, this, will, this, you know, up until this point, a lot, a lot of people have described the Roberts Court as the O'Connor Court or the Kennedy Court or somewhat pejoratively the O'Kennedy Court. Um, no, after this, it really will be the, the Roberts Court. Right. Well, at, at this time of, of polarization, isn't it refreshing to be able to sit on a, an afternoon and, and chat civilly ab about these things with such great experts? Um, and you can see why I enjoy having Cy as, a, as one of my colleagues here, and, and I'm really looking forward to working with Micah on the Democracy Project. So please give them a warm round of applause.